So one of the distinguishing features of the John Birch Society is it's very dedicated and professional field staff. Uh, made up of its field representatives who work to build our influence, our membership, and our effectiveness. So supervising your field coordinators, we have what are called regional field directors. So it's now my pleasure to call to the podium Mr. Wayne Morrow. And he's our Eastern Regional Field Director, and he's going to introduce our future speaker tonight. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, you know, it isn't, uh, I have to say this, uh, I grew up in Amsterdam, so I'm back home. Uh, I don't live here now, but uh, it's good to be here. Uh, the reason why I'm in the Birch Society is because of Ed Clements. Uh, Ed uh, got me in the Birch Society 42 years ago. So you can blame him. <laughs> but it's the best thing I ever did. The greatest people you ever want to meet. So, uh, yes, I am uh, now reside in uh, Florida. I escaped the snow. I used to live in New England. And uh, before I did all that, I lived in Amsterdam. I moved to Niskiuna. I lived there for a little while, and so I'm back at home. I told my oldest daughter, she said, Dad, I remember living in Niskuna. What does it stand for? I said, I looked it up. It's an Indian word for high taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can relate, huh? <laughs> so I want to tell you this, because yes, I do 30 states now. I, I run around with 30 states. We have people like Kip, uh, who is a fantastic coordinator. I don't do this alone. We have lots of members. You're not alone. I tell people I travel around the 30 states, you are not alone. In Florida, we have Trump clubs, five, 600 people at a time. Tim Martin's here someplace, and he's a Floridian as well. He'll tell you there's many people, not just you. So I know you look out here and say, well, I'm the only person who gets this. That's not true. Just want you to let you know that. I'm kind of curious. Who are visitors here today? Raise your hands. Never been here before. Oh, maybe 20, 30. Welcome. So to you, it's stay educated, not indoctrinated. That's what's about tonight. So I want to introduce our speaker. You want to listen to what he has to say. I know Trevor. Trevor is a Floridian as well, so he escaped the cold weather too. I guess that was in New Zealand. I don't know if it's cold, but he's a Floridian. And uh, so he's enjoying 80 degree weather as well. So here is introduction for Trevor as follows. Our speaker is an author and filmmaker and public speaker from Christ Church of New Zealand. So he has an accent, so we can interpret later. <laughs> Not really. But I'm from New England, so I can get this. For more than 30 years, he has researched the radical left, and boy, he has, Marxist and terrorist movements, and their covert influence on mainstream politics. He's maintained a blog, TrevorLoudon.com, and the founder and editor of the website, KeyWinky.org which compiles dossiers and activists and political figures. Got a chance to visit it? Good job. <coughs> Trevor Lowndes' thesis is commonly regarded as a mainstream of political policy, is in fact driven, guided by hidden subversive elements. Trevor believes that these forces must be exposed and countered as America continues to roll as a bastion of freedom is pivotal for the future of Western civilization, as Ed mentioned. You can't do this alone. We need all of you. Some of Trevor's accomplishments are many. I'll just name a few here. In collaboration with the Capital Research Center, Trevor Lowden and Director Judge Saul created many documentaries which are free to the public. Number one, America Under Siege, Civil War 2017. America Under Siege, Soviet Islam. America in the siege, Antifa. That would be a good one for now. Trevor's hard-hitting political documentaries, The Enemy Within, which was released in 2016. I was one of the first ones to see that down in Florida. Trevor is also working on a new film uh, with Judge, uh, director Judge Saul, Enemies Within the Church. But I'll tell you, when I see, I try to get pastors involved in our fight. Because I, uh, this is a spiritual battle, as you all well know. Powers and principality of the air. We're going to win this battle. The church has to wake up. Trevor Lowden also discovered long-hidden relationships between the notorious 
Hawaiian Communist Party member Frank Marshall Davis, and young Barack Obama in 2004. <coughs> After researching this, Obama's ties to New York and Chicago Marxist movements, Loudon began publishing his findings online, catching the eye of such prominent voices as AIM and syndicated radio host Glenn Beck. In 2009, Loudon exposed the kindest roots of Obama administration, Green Jobs sire Van Jones. Nice guy. After an extensive campaign, Glenn Beck and others, Jones was forced to resign the White House position. Good job, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since 2011, Trump has toured the United States from his two books, Barack Obama, Enemies Within, and Enemies Within, Communist, Socialist, and Progressive in the U.S. Congress. Extensively footing and exposed, recently unfolding Marxist takeover of our U.S. government. He spoke to 400 conservative tea parties and religious organizations throughout 37 states. And he's been interviewed by uh, many people on both sides of the struggle. This research has given Loudon unique insight to how extensively even awful minuscule communist parties have been able to manipulate even control of foreign policy in Western countries, particularly the main enemy of the United States. His research has shown that it's not just a historical problem, but it's a grave and looming threat, which not only impacts national security, but our very survival. Trevor probably served as a fellow member of the American Freedom Alliance and Inter-American Institute for Public Policy, sorry, Philosophy, Government, and Social Thought. Okay, uh, Tri-City folks, let's give it up for Mr. Trevor Love. Thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you very much, Ed, for that excellent introduction. Um, can everybody hear me okay? You understand the southern accent all right? Okay. Thank you. Um, well, it's great to be here in Albany. I've never been to this part of the state before, and it is as beautiful as I thought it would be. It's, it's fantastic here. If you can get rid of the politicians, this will be in a northern paradise. <laughs> now, I want to tell a little story before I start. Any refugees from California here tonight? <laughs> when I was in Los Angeles recently, I walked up to a street vendor, I bought some food. And the guy he gave me the food, he said, um, you've got an accent, where are you from? And I said, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? <laughs> So to make it easy for him, I said, look, it's down near Australia. He said, ah, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> so that explains some of the voting problems in California. People. Look, I, I, want to, I want to give a shout out to the JBS because I first started reading JBS literature in 1976 in New Zealand. And we distributed a lot of it down there. And it made a big impact on me. And I, I think I wouldn't know what I know today had I not been coached in the literature of the JBS. So look, absolutely. And I, I also don't think any of us would be here today had it not been for the work of the JBS over the last 60 years. I think the battle probably would have already been lost. And I think the JBS is the unsung hero of the American constitutional movement in the last 60 years. And if you're considering joining, please do, because you will hear truth there like you'll never hear anywhere else. And as um, you know, and Ed laid it out pretty well, I think. So I'd like you to really consider that. Now, people ask me all the time, you know, why as a New Zealander, I should even care about the United States. You don't know I live in a perfectly safe country down here? Well, no, it's not actually, but we'll get to that later. Um, when I say there are two reasons. The first is simple gratitude. You know, my country was facing invasion by the Japanese during World War II. And if it hadn't been for the huge sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea and Midway, 
we would have been done, folks. And that's a very strong memory in my country to this day. The second reason is related, but it's a little more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If you should ever lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority, all of which took a huge trashing through the Obama years, if that trend had continued, people, we would be living in a world controlled out of Moscow and Beijing and Havana and Tehran and the UN headquarters in New York. And is that the kind of world you'd like to leave your children, people? No. No. So anybody who cares about liberty, anybody who cares about freedom, has to care about the United States. You know, um, a lot of people say to me, if things turn bad in America, can I come down and live in New Zealand? <laughs> and I say, well, yeah, if, if you want to learn Chinese, it'd probably be a, a good option. Because, look, recently, I'll give you an example, about three years ago, the Australian Minister of Defence was up in China for talks. And if you don't know where Australia is, it's a little country off our west coast. <laughs> <laughs> but he was up in China for talks, and the top Chinese general said to him, he said, uh, look, Australia needs a godfather. You need someone to look out for you. Now... Will it be, the big question for you is, will it be an American godfather or a Chinese godfather? Well, if you're smart, you will choose China because we are the growing power in the region. So how do you think that makes us feel down there, folks? And when we saw Obama stripping the Seventh Fleet, destroying the Seventh Fleet, while China's building 60 ships a year, how do you think that makes Australia and New Zealand and the Philippines and South Korea feel, folks. And I just got to say, uh, there's a bit of good news on the front, as, as Ed said. Mr. Bolsonaro won the election in Brazil yesterday, 55 to 44%. You'll hear nothing but the accusations of him being a fascist for the next month. But he is a very, very honest, anti-communist, pro-freedom individual. And he's now leading the biggest country in South America. And that's a huge boost for us, folks. We should be very, very grateful to the Brazilians for having the sense to elect him. I think he'd be a great ally for President Trump. So we do win some, people. Now, I deal... Well, I want to say a few things about the last election. The first is, you know, November 2016... Does anybody think there might have been a touch of the miraculous on that election? <laughs> right? I think even, the, even an atheist would have to acknowledge that one. Because, you know, we, were all, we all knew that Hillary was supposed to win, right? It was all preordained and, you know, it was all over by the shouting. But on election night 2016, it didn't turn out that way. But I think we have to guard against the feeling that some have... But well, President Trump's in the White House now, everything's okay and we don't have to do anything. Well, we know that President Trump is not a perfect being and that he can be, he, you know, though he's done a lot of tremendous things, as Ed pointed out, there are dangers in being blind followers. That some, he will have advisors around him who will try and sell him a bill of goods, like they will in certain trade deals, etc. But I think we must be grateful all the same for that election victory. Imagine how we'd all be feeling tonight if Hillary Clinton was the president of people. But I see that election as it didn't save America by a long shot, but it did give us a stay of execution. It gave us a reprieve. It bought some time for us. It gave us a second chance, folks, because a hundred years of progressivism was about to tip this country off the cliff. And that held us back. But, you know, if you look at, you know, it's a second chance. And if you look at the Old Testament, there's a lot of second chances in the Old Testament. But how many third chances were there, people? You know, the Israelites are not doing the right thing. They get a second chance. But how many times did they get a third chance? So I think we're on a second chance, and we better seize it with both hands 
and do the absolute maximum we can with it, folks. The second thing I'll say, you know, I know there's some very strong political activists in this room who've, who've spent their lives, um, you know, writing checks and driving miles and organising meetings and delivering lectures and, and, and just working, working, working for this country. Well, was it all worth it on election night, people? Did it give the country a bit of hope? Would you do it all again to get the same result? So I want you to hang on to that feeling, people, because we did have a victory on that election night, and we've got to appreciate that. The third thing I'll say, the Germans have this wonderful word, um, schadenfreude, mm -hmm. and it means to take pleasure in the pain of others. <laughs> it's not a very noble thing, right? You don't boast about it. But on election night 2016, about 2 o'clock in the morning, when they panned the Democratic Party headquarters, and you saw those little snowflakes bawling their eyes out and hugging each other, did anybody feel a little bit of schadenfreude? <laughs> Just a little bit? And after eight years of Obama trashing your country, you think you deserved it? Well, hang on to that feeling, people, because I want to feel it again in, 20, in a week's time, and in 2022, and 2024, and, and onwards. And I think we can do that, people. Now, I deal with mainly national security, but I deal with the aspect of it that very few organisations beyond the John Birch Society ever touch, and that is internal security. And when you... I know there's probably a, quite a few ex-military people or maybe serving military people in the room tonight. And I know that anybody who goes into the military swears an oath that does not end at the end of your service, by the way, swears an oath to defend your constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? And which is more dangerous in the long run? An enemy wearing a uniform pointing a gun at you from over there, or an enemy wearing a suit and tie in your Congress or your Senate, trashing your constitution every single chance they get. Which is more dangerous, people? So has anybody in the room ever had to undergo any form of FBI background check or security check for a government or even a private sector position? Anybody? Yeah, quite a few of you, okay, a lot of you. Well, is it true that those checks can be pretty darn rigorous? They look at your family background, your overseas travel, criminal convictions, dodgy relatives. You know, I, I had a friend who applied for a federal government job during the Obama terms of office, and the FBI sent two agents all the way to Canada to interview that man's communist uncle. And on the strength of that interview, my friend, a staunch conservative, was denied that position. <laughs> Not because he was a communist, because his uncle was. And I will say this, I support that decision. Because you have the most powerful country in the world here, folks. And you have a whole bunch of enemies out there who will use your weak and dishonest to betray you. And that can cost millions of lives. It delivered China to the communist people and a whole bunch of other things. So I don't think you can be too careful when it comes to internal security. I think you've got to be very, very rigorous. But what if you're a young Marxist radical who hangs around with the Communist Party or Democratic Socialists of America, which has got about 100 members in this town right now? Or you might hang around with the Muslim Brotherhood with CARE or ISNA or ICNA, one of the many Muslim Brotherhood fronts operating legally and openly in this country. And you get elected to Congress, or even the Senate, where you may serve on the Homeland Security Committee, or the Armed Services Committee, or the Science and Technology Committee, or even the Intelligence Committee of the House of Representatives. How much of an FBI background check do you need for that one, folks? Zero. Nothing. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you do it, right? How's that been working out? 
Can you see the problem there? The media is on the wrong side. The good, the bad guys aren't going to get exposed, are they? So, but um, you know, but you would say, well, a lot of people say, well, look, that can't be right, you know. Look, you know, you can't have people going into Congress who who have no background checks. Surely not. You know, that wouldn't happen. You know, you got the FBI to sort that out, right? Well, which committee does the FBI answer to in Congress, people? It's the Judiciary Committee, the most powerful, Congress, <coughs> most powerful committee in your Congress. It controls the FBI and oversees, well, oversees the FBI and oversees the Justice Department. So the FBI is supposed to arrest the spies, detect and arrest the spies and terrorists, and the, and the Justice Department is supposed to prosecute them, right? So on the, Justice, on the Justice Judicial Committee right now, you have Judy Chu from California, okay? Now she was a long-time supporter of the Communist Workers' Party, the most militant, radical, pro-Chinese Communist Party in this country. She um, still works with many of many former Communist Workers' Party people today. She controls the Asia-Pacific Caucus in your Congress, which is about 30 members strong. She is uh, regarded as China's best friend in your Congress. And you should see Judy Chu go off on the FBI whenever they have the temerity to arrest one of the 25,000 plus Chinese spies currently operating in this country. You are a racist organization. The FBI is racist. You're only persecuting these people because you hate Chinese. And she has arranged for the FBI to undergo, undergo sensitivity training so they won't be racist towards the Chinese spies they find working in this country. And then you've got Luis Gutierrez from Illinois, who was a leader of the pro-Cuban Marxist-Leninist Puerto Rican Socialist Party. Now he was elected several times in Chicago with the help of the Communist Party USA and the League of Revolutionary Struggle, a pro-Chinese organization. He even endorsed their magazine. <coughs> he is also very, very actively involved with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a front for the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas the Middle Eastern terrorist organization. And then you have Jerry Nadler from New York. Now Jerry Nadler is now the man who will take over the Justice Department. Well, I'll go back a little bit before we talk about Jerry, because the man he is replacing, a man called John Conyers, mm. some of you might have heard of him. He was a Congress of 140, 160 years, I believe, <laughs> you know, from Michigan. Just had to retire last year in disgrace. But I would say he was probably the single most dangerous congressman in the last 50 years in your, in your house. Because for most of that time, he was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee when the Democrats controlled the House, and he was the ranking Democrat in the few occasions that they didn't. Now, John Conyers is the man who abolished your House Un-American Activities Committee, mm -hmm. right? He destroyed one of your main defense mechanisms in this country. So he has been replaced by Jerry Nadler. Now, Jerry Nadler is the man that will, has threatened to reinvestigate uh, Brett Kavanaugh if he is the chairman, which could happen next week, could. And he is the man who will lead the impeachment of President Trump if, if the Democrats regain the House. Jerry Nadler has been a Marxist, a member of Democratic Socialists of America, since at least 1977. So you will have a Marxist leading the impeachment of your president and reinvestigating one of your Supreme Court justices. How do you think that will go, folks? And we'll go back to John Conyers himself. <clears throat> that man... Well, okay, I'll go back another step. Any Vietnam veterans in the room tonight? 
I'm sure there's one or two. Well, several, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Now, John, John, okay, I want to ask a couple of questions of you veterans. One of them is very stupid, but I think you'll see where I'm going. First, was the Vietnam War lost in the jungles of Vietnam? Every veteran says absolutely not. Is it true that you had some pretty tough rules of engagement in Vietnam? You weren't allowed to uh, mine Haiphong Harbour or bomb Haiphong Harbour. You weren't allowed to fire at, at, at uh, enemy troop, you know, per, you know, movements unless they were in certain areas. Um, you weren't allowed to chase the enemy across borders and hot pursuits. You weren't allowed to hold territory. You had to allow the enemy to re-infiltrate, undo all of your work. Is any of that true? Okay, here's a dumb question. Did those rules of engagement in any way hamper your ability to fight and win that war? Right? So had you been allowed to fight that war to actually win it, like you did in World War II, to take the fight right to the heart of the enemy, to invade North Vietnam, which is the size of New Jersey, could you have won that war and pretty darn quickly? Sure. Okay. And is it also true that when you withdrew, well here's another, when you withdrew that your Congress defunded the South Vietnamese military, guaranteeing a communist takeover? Well, I got a little, this goes, so Congress was a problem. But it goes a lot higher than that. I've got this story from Admiral Ace Lyons, who was the commander of the Pacific Fleet. You had a Secretary of State during that war, a man called Dean Rusk. Well, every night, Dean Rusk would get the bombing orders for North Vietnam the next day across his desk. So he knew exactly where all your planes were going to fly and what targets they were going to hit. So every night, he would pass those instructions on to the Swedish Embassy in Washington, D.C., who would send them to the North Vietnamese. So they knew exactly where your planes were going to fly the next day so they could put their guns in the perfect place to bring them down. You lost 58,000 men in that war, people. 58,000 young Americans in a war you were not allowed to win. 58,000 of your church friends, your high school buddies, your cousins, your uncles, your football teammates, I guarantee by seeing some of the faces that many of you in this room were affected by that war, even if you didn't fight enough. I say this, folks, that war was deliberately sabotaged in your government and your Congress by people like Father Drynan from down in Massachusetts, who was working hand in glove with the Communist Party USA which was taking its orders directly from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was allied to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. Do you think there might have been a little bit of treason going on there, folks? And what's the penalty for treason, folks? So why did all those congressmen and senators who condemned tens of thousands of your young boys to completely unnecessary deaths how many of them paid a single penalty for what they did, folks? One of them served as Obama's Secretary of State, a man called John Kerry. I call him Jane Fonda with less testosterone. And one of them was John Conyers, people. He was one of the main culprits. So John Conyers, has got a 50-year history with the Communist Party USA, 40 years with Democratic Socialists of America, 30 years with the Workers' World Party, which supports North Korea and Iran and Cuba, and is very actively involved in several Muslim Brotherhood fronts. When your, some of your Republican congressmen tried to get the Muslim Brotherhood designated as a terrorist organization, which it absolutely is, John Conyers, on the Judiciary Committee says, well, no, and I've got him on film, on my movie saying this, no, the Muslim Brotherhood has given up violence now. Now it's a valuable social service organization and we shouldn't go after them. John Conyers 
was a hardcore anti-American Marxist Leninist. As hardcore as you can get, people. Yet for more than 40 years, he oversaw the FBI. What do you think is going to happen to the FBI's budget if they come to the Judiciary Committee and say, we need to start investigating congressmen? You think the FBI is stupid enough to bite the hand that feeds it? So you're a young Marxist radical. You get elected to Congress. There's no background checks. The media is not going to touch you, and the FBI doesn't dare come near you. The FBI has not investigated congressmen in your country since at least the 1940s. At least. They are untouchable people. I'll give you one more example, and again he's in my movie, if you don't believe me, and I've got him on tape saying this. This is a young man, a, 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 a gentleman from Indiana called Andre Carson, one of your two Muslim members of Congress. And he's very actively involved with CARE and ISNA and ITNA and all these Muslim Brotherhood fronts. And so he's at a meeting in Connecticut of, the, of one of these fronts in 2012, and he gets up in front of the audience about this size, and with a big grin on his face, he says, I understand there are people in the room, undercover, who are spying on us because you think we are here plotting to overthrow and destroy this country. Well, I say to you people spying on us, Allah will not allow you to stop us. <laughs> that man currently serves on your intelligence committee, people, overseeing the CIA, the FBI, NSA, you name it. You have got at least a hundred members of your Congress right now, right now, not in the 50s, right now, and at least 20 members of your Senate, including both of the New York delegation, <coughs> who are so involved in Marxist organizations, Muslim Brotherhood fronts, or are allied to China, Iran, or Cuba, or other enemies of your nation. They are so involved in these anti-American activities, they would have no chance whatsoever of passing a basic background check. They couldn't clean the toilets at any military base in your country. They couldn't be a realtor in Florida. But they're serving on the Homeland Security Committee, the Armed Services Committee, and the Intelligence Committee, and they're trashing your constitution every chance they get. You are sending brave men and women every day to foreign countries to fight horrible foreign enemies. And every single day, those brave men and women are being betrayed by people in your Congress working for the other side. Right now. Now I want to talk about, other than the traitors in your Congress and Senate, which are a bit of an issue, I want to talk about what I consider is the single most dangerous and looming national security threat you face right now. And I'm not talking about Russia or China or Iran or Cuba or the Muslim Brotherhood or Hamas or Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And I do not downgrade any of those. They're all hugely dangerous. But I think the thing that could destroy this country more quickly and more certainly than anything else is illegal immigration. <coughs> And most people don't really see this as a national security threat. This is more of a rule of law issue, or it's a you know, public health issue, or it's a jobs issue, or whatever. But I see it as a national security threat, very much so. And I want to explain a little bit of the history of this. Now, back in the 1950s in California, there was a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. He was also a big time Democrat, he was a friend of Bobby Kennedy, and he was the first, and he organized the Viva Kennedy Clubs, the first organized effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. And he got a whole bunch of money from Chicago. Every time the Catholics up there had a Lenten appeal, they gave a lot of money to the, to the appeal, and that went to a man called Saul Alinsky, right? 
You know him as the radical Marxist from Chicago, the, the mentor of Hillary Clinton, the inspiration of Barack Obama. And he would send a whole bunch of money down to Bert Corona, who set up a whole network of support groups for illegal immigrants in Southern California, clear across to Texas. And the purpose of these groups was to encourage illegals across the border, get them work in factories and farms, get their kids in school, and get them settled. Now, Corona trained a whole bunch of acolytes to carry on his work for him, several hundreds of them. Now, three of them have worked very closely together. They're a little clique, and they have transformed California people. Just three or four of these people working together. All Corona um, disciples, basically. Now, the first of them is a man called Antonio Villagarosa. Until recently, the mayor of Los Angeles. A hardcore Marxist. He used to go down to Cuba to cut sugar cane for the Castros. Now, he turned Los Angeles into a full-on sanctuary city. He forbade the LAPD from enforcing any immigration laws, and the illegals flooded in to LA and Orange County in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Second member of this little group, a Communist Party supporter named Gil Cedillo, until recently the Democratic head of the California State Senate. He was the man who recently organized for illegals in that state to get driver's licenses, plus many other things. The third member of this little clique, another hardcore Marxist, she serves on the Democratic National Committee right now. Um, I regard her as the most dangerous woman in California. Her name is Maria Elena Durazzo. She was until recently the head of the California AFL-CIO. And she was the woman behind the massive union-driven, because you've got to understand, people in California, all the unions are communist control, as they are in most states in this country now, and definitely the top of the AFL-CIO. So they basically, she organized these massive union-driven and union-paid-for Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that added hundreds of thousands of new Latino voters, legal and illegal, to the California rolls in the last 20 years. Now, most of those Latinos are Christian and conservative, but guess which party they vote for by a margin of nearly six to one? It ain't the Republicans, people. The result of this deliberate Marxist program, a completely deliberate program, has been to turn California from a reddish, purplish state to solidly blue. And that's very, very important when it comes to presidential elections because California has the biggest number of electoral college votes and that is hugely beneficial to the Democrats every presidential election. Gives them a big leg up. Now, the leader of the amnesty movement today in this country is a man called Alisayo Medina. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America and a leader of SEIU, the biggest private sector union in your country. And I'm sure there's a few union, former or current union members tonight. And do you remember 25, 30 years ago how hardcore opposed to illegal immigrant amnesty that the union movement was? The unions had people on the border, folks. They were trying to stop the illegals coming over because they didn't want their strikes broken. They didn't want their jobs taken. They didn't want their wages and conditions lowered. Now, the unions were constantly lobbying Congress to increase penalties on any employer caught employing illegals because this would take their jobs, folks. It was very logical from a union point of view. Now, which organizations in America right now are leading the charge to legalize the illegals? It's the unions. Because in 1994, Lane Kirkland was deposed as, or 95 it might have been, deposed as president of the AFL-CIO, and the Marxist Democratic Socialist of America member, John Sweeney, took his place. 
and Democratic Socialists of America staged a coup at the top of the American labor movement. So they changed their emphasis from protecting the jobs of American workers to promoting socialist revolution. And it was Alisay Medina at the AFL-CIO's convention in Los Angeles in 2000 that persuaded all those union guys to change their policy from complete opposition to amnesty to complete support for amnesty. A 100% reversal done by this Marxist operative. Now, Alisay Medina, all through the Obama years, was Obama's chief advisor on all issues of immigration. And again, I've got Obama in my movie saying this. So the big question is this though, why are the Democrats so absolutely obsessed with DACA and amnesty? Why are they absolutely opposed to building a wall when under, before there was a big changeover in the AFL-CIO, Bill Clinton and Harry Reid used to make endless speeches condemning illegal immigration as harming American workers. Well, Alice and Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington, D.C. In, two, in 2009, I believe it was. Again, I've got him on tape saying this. He gets up in front of the crowd and says this, passing amnesty for our 11 million undocumented workers is the number one, the number one priority of the progressive movement. And did he talk about compassion or reuniting families or giving immigrants a break or the American dream? Not a single word, folks. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos in this country voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we get citizenship and voting rights for our 11 million undocumented workers, they will stand with our movement. That will give the Democrats at least 8 million new voters. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, forever. Do a little bit of math, people. MIT just released a study saying there were 22 million illegals in the country right now. I've heard credible INS officials put the estimate more like 40 million. But let's go with 22. That, on current voting patterns, that would give the Democrats 15, 16 million new potential voters, right? So Mitt Romney lost his election by two and a half million votes. Donald Trump won by 200,000 votes, thanks to the wisdom of your founding fathers and the Electoral College, and actually lost the popular vote by 3 million. So what do you think that's going to do to your country if the Democrats get 15 or 16 million new voters overnight? Texas is gone. Georgia's gone. Florida's gone. Um, Alabama's probably gone even. North Carolina's definitely gone. You would never elect another conservative president again. Ever. And if you think the Democrats are arrogant now, what do you think they'll be like with 15 or 16 million new voters in, your, in their pockets and no chance of ever being defeated ever again? People... It ain't going to become like France or Germany, as Sean Hannity tries to tell you. These are the people who are leading the Democratic Party today who supported the Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. These are the people that rooted for the Sandinista communists in the 80s. These are Marxists. And am amnesty gives them complete power over this country. And they will use it, folks. They want their revolution before they die. Hillary Clinton, if you remember, promised to legalize every single illegal immigrant and give them citizenship and voting rights within 100 days of taking office. On election night 2016, people, you came that close to losing your country. That close. Anybody think I'm exaggerating here? And I think most of the leadership of the Republican Party is still clueless on this. 
because you've got a whole bunch of them still wanting to go for comprehensive immigration reform. Their code word for amnesty, because they get a whole bunch of money from the Chamber of Commerce who wants a whole bunch of cheap labour in your country. They are willing to commit, commit electoral suicide for that money, and that's their problem. But the problem is, it kills us too. So now, has anybody seen, you know, this might sound a little bit depressing, right, but it does get better. Because if I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. <laughs> Seriously. Okay? Wow. So if you look at the last election cycle, has anybody seen as much vitriol and contempt directed at a sitting president as this one? <coughs> Reagan, Bush 1, Bush 2? At least they got a break every now and then, right? This president has never got a break. Not for one second. So why do they hate him so much? Well, I think part of it is very easy to understand. You know, it's human nature. Because on election night, the Democrats were so pumped up and so believing their own propaganda that when it all went south, they were like a bunch of kids who thought they were going to get the best bike you've ever seen for Christmas and they got a pair of socks. <laughs> and we all know that feeling, right? But you sort of get over, it, get over it after a month, don't you? You know, you sort of move on, you know, you, you, you sort of man up, toughen up. So I think that's part of it. But this is not ended. So what is the real underlying reason? Well, see, if you're a modern Democrat, and I'm not talking about your next door neighbour who goes deer hunting and is a member of the NRA and is probably a veteran and still thinks he's voting for JFK. You know, I'm not talking about those guys. I'm talking about the hardcore leadership Democrats. So you believe in identity politics. You believe that you are not individuals out there. You are groups, racial groups, ethnic groups who are there to be manipulated to achieve power. So you believe that you own the black population, right? And you own all those white union guys out in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And you own the Latinos. And you own a lot of the Asian Americans. And you own the Native Americans. And the soccer moms. And the millennials. These are your base. This is what gets you elected. And you own them. Well, when President Trump went out to Pennsylvania and Ohio and said, so where's all these high pan union jobs you used to have? What are all these closed down factories down out here? All this, why do they call this the Rust Belt? You know, is this what NAFTA and voting Democrat has given you guys? Well, I understand that we cannot defend this country without an industrial base. And that you deserve jobs. And we're going to bring the industry back to the Midwest. Are you with me? And a whole bunch of those Democrats, those white union guys, went down to the polling booth and for the first time in their life, they pulled the lever for a Republican. And not any Republican, for candidate Trump. Because they believed he was sincere in his promises. Or at least they hoped he might be. And when he went to the black communities, and he said, so your inner cities are a bit of a mess, guys. I see a lot of poverty and crime and drugs and dependency. And just on that subject, before I carry on, how do you tell how secure your borders are, people? The top INS officer told me this. It is by the price of heroin on your streets. When the heroin's cheap, your borders are loose. And how cheap's heroin right now, people? Is it killing a few of your young people? 60,000 Americans a year. The Chinese are bringing the drugs the, um, the real bad one, fentanyl, put it, take it to Mexico, they bring it across the border. The, the heroin is coming from Latin America across the border. So the Democrats know that you are losing 60,000 young people a year, but they consider that it's more important to bring a new voting base across the border. We're not dealing with the old-fashioned Democrats, people. We're dealing with pure human evil here. We've got to understand that. So, 
When he went, when President Trump went to the black communities and said, I see a lot of drugs, poverty, crime. This is what 50 years of voting Democrats has given you guys. Well, why don't you vote for me? What do you got to lose? And a whole bunch of them said, heck yeah, and they did. And this is freaking the Democrats out, people. This is freaking them out, because they only have to lose a bit of that white union base and a bit of that black base, and they're done. Black approval of President Trump is now 35%. You haven't seen that since Lincoln, folks. <laughs> you know? And this is freaking the Democrats out like you wouldn't believe because they understand that if they don't win these next two elections and your president is successful and he builds that wall so young black kids can actually get jobs in their own communities again, if he rebuilds the industry in the Midwest and if he can keep those taxes coming down, those regulations coming down. They understand the money is going to flow, people. You know, if anybody noticed the difference between the Trump economy and the Obama economy? Yeah. Slight difference out there? Well, that's just the beginning because, you know, a lot of business people have opened their checkbooks, but they're looking at, well, well what if um, the Democrats come back? Is all my investment going to go down the drain? If there's another Trump term, people, and we influence it in the right way, the money that is going to flow into your economy will be unbelievable. The investment from both here and overseas that will flow into your industries, into your factories, into your, in, to create employment and higher wages for your people will be phenomenal. We'll have an economic boom like you have not seen before. And what do you think the Democrats are going to do then, people? Their message is abortion, poverty, and dependence. How's that going to sell in a booming America where every ethnic community is making a lot of money and doing very nicely, thank you very much? They understand this is their last stand. This is their Tet Offensive. And you know the story of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam? You know, your troops, despite all the handicaps, had the North Vietnamese virtually defeated but they mounted a massive counterattack in 68, a suicidal counterattack, was slaughtered all over the country, huge military loss, but it turned the tide of public opinion in America. That's when Americans stopped supporting the war. And it was all over by the shouting from that point. Well, the Democrats are doing their Tet Offensive right now. They're throwing everything they can at you in a suicidal, last gasp attempt to take you out, to turn public opinion away from the president, from the Republicans, from conservatism, you know, so, so they can get you. Or well, call their bluff, people. This is not the time to call to back down. This is the time to double down. Basically, call their bluff and defeat them. So the Democrats understand that they are a very crucial point because if, you're, if the economy's gone good and the wall gets built and the whole bunch of the economy and the other things are going well, they really haven't got much to offer. And they could be out of office for a very, very, very long time. Their party will probably split and we could see a complete realignment in US politics. You know, I think the, Demo the Republican Party will become much more populist, much more constitutional, much less rhino-ish, and the Democratic Party could fade away for a very long time. So that's one side of what could happen. So then we're at a crossroads, you know. If things go badly in the next election and the president gets impeached, it's all going to start going south. And this country could get a lot worse. But if we, can, if we can win the next election and string some victories together, things could go very much more in a positive direction. Very much more. And that could come down to one or two seats in the Congress. One or two seats may make the difference between Nancy Pelosi haranguing you every night on TV or Jim Jordan of the Freedom Caucus being that Speaker of the House. That could be huge, folks. So... 
We're at a crossroads. We really, really are. And every election they say, this is the most important election of your life cycle, of your life. Well, this one actually is. Because the Trump agenda that may come to a screeching halt in a week's time, or it may gather steam, and if he wins this election, if he holds the House and increases his majority in the Senate, I think he will easily win 2020. Easily. So, and as we know, that's not a guarantee of everything going right, because the JBS and other organisations have to make sure that when he does the bad stuff, he gets called on it. But this is how, this is, this is what's going to happen, because the Democrats have a plan. Right? And this is what it is. The first part of the plan is to destroy the president. Impeach the president, ridicule the president, um, shut, that, shut down all your social media, your Twitter accounts, your Facebook pages, um, critics, you know, call you all fascists and Nazis, just dispirit you, everything they can to destroy any form of nationalism or patriotism in this country. So that's the first part. The second part is this. Who remembers the old Rainbow Coalition of the 1980s? Mm -hmm. Right? That great scamster Jesse Jackson, right? <laughs> so he got this idea. He ran for president twice, 84 and 88, and nobody gave him a prayer, right? He was regarded as pretty marginal even then. But he ran twice, and in the second election, 1988, he got 7 million votes and fourth in the Democratic primary which amazed a lot of people. It was pretty impressive. Now, the way, the way he did this was quite clever. He borrowed this from a Black Panther member in, in Chicago who was murdered by the, uh, was shot by the police when he got in a gunfight with them. And um, his name was Fred Hampton, but Jesse Jackson adopted his, his, his idea. You run on a rainbow coalition strategy. You get the progressive whites Progressive Latinos, Progressive Asian Americans, Native Americans, Gay Americans, Muslim Americans, Asian Americans. And this is their terminology. So you've got the white stripe, the yellow stripe, the brown stripe, the red stripe, the green stripe, the Rainbow Coalition. Now that Rainbow Coalition was run largely by Maoist Communists, specifically the 3,000 member strong League of Revolutionary Struggle. Now they were hardcore people. And they staffed the whole thing. They ran it for him. Now, when Jesse Jackson lost in 88, he went on to other scams. And the Rainbow Coalition dissolved, and most of them, uh, the League of Revolutionary Struggle dissolved, and most of them went into the Democratic Party. One of them was a young man called Stephen Phillips. He was a black law student from Stanford University, a League of Revolutionary Struggle guy, and he ran the West Coast student operation for the Rainbow Coalition for the whole of 1988. So he learned a lot. In about 1992, he married, married very, very well. He married his Stanford University sweetheart, a young woman named Susan Sandler. Now Sandler was the daughter of um, Herb and Marion Sandler, who ran Golden West S Savings and Loan in California. Very big operation. They sold it to Wachovia for $2.8 billion. That bankrupted Wachovia, and Wachovia had to join up with Wells Fargo. But anyway, they got their $2.8 billion, and they put half of it into the progressive movement. They found Centre for American Progress, ProPublica, and a whole bunch of your candidates. So Steve Phillips, the young revolutionary, has now got access to hundreds of millions of dollars. And he became the envoy of the Sandler family into the Democratic Party and the progressive movement. In 2005, he was sent, um, sent to Atlanta, Georgia, for a meeting with uh, George Soros and Tom Steyer and Norman Lear of People for the American Way, a whole bunch of left-wing billionaires and multimillionaires. And they set up a group called the Democracy Alliance which is very, very secretive, and now has about 150 very wealthy members. And they are putting huge amounts of money right now into the progressive movement, and Steve Phillips is the man who tells them where to put it. 
So Steve Phillips had another project in 2008. He got, he got, um, he got $10 million together and he ran the Rainbow Coalition strategy in 18 mainly southern states, signing up huge numbers of black and Latino voters in those states. And he did that for his favorite candidate, a young man called Barack Obama. And that's what got Obama ahead of Hillary Clinton. There would have been no President Obama without Steve Phillips and his buddies. Now today, Steve Phillips runs Democracy in Color, Power Pack, Sam the Phillips Foundation, and a whole bunch of other organizations. He's involved in the Center for American Progress, Democracy Alliance, very influential guy. So his project now is to rerun the Na Rainbow Coalition strategy in this election cycle and the next on a nationwide basis. He's written a book, it's called Brown is the New White, endorsed by Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi, and it's the Bible of the Democratic Party today. And he argues very simply, see back in the Jesse Jackson's day, minorities were 12% of the population, Today, they are 38% of the population. So Jackson was ahead of his time. So Steve Phillips argues that 28% of the electorate today are progressives of color. They will vote, you know, these are Asian Americans, Black Americans, Native Americans, Muslim Americans, and they are reliable Democratic Party voters. 23% of the electorate are white progressives. And I'm sorry about all these racial terms, but this is his terminology, okay? 23% of the electorate are, are white progressives. They would vote Democrat if Adolf Hitler was on the ticket. They wouldn't care. So 23 plus 28 is 51%. The new American majority. Google that phrase, new American majority. This is a new code word for the Rainbow Coalition. And it's all over the internet right now. So Steve Phillips and the Democracy Alliance is putting huge amounts of money all over the country, but, but mainly in five southern states. North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, southern and southwestern, Arizona, Florida, and Texas. And they're backing governor's races in three of those. They, have product, they are backing our David Garcia in Arizona, are backing Andrew Gillum, who's a complete Maoist communist in uh, Florida, and Stacey Abrams, who's a complete Marxist as well, in Georgia. All three of them are protégés of Steve Phillips. All of them. And they're putting millions of dollars behind these candidates, and they're doing massive voter registration drives in these states. And right now, Gillum is slightly ahead in, in Florida, and um, Stacey Abrams is level pegging in Georgia, Garcia is a little bit behind in Arizona. See, the, the logic is very simple. Stacey Abrams says it very well. Democrats, stop wasting your time putting billions of dollars into K Street lobbyists and, and PR people to shift 2% of the population to your column. Spend that money in massive voter registration drives in the southern states where there are huge Latino and black populations that lean Democrat but don't normally vote. So right now they're going for Arizona because Trump won Arizona by 200,000 votes, but there were 600,000 Latinos in that state that could have voted but didn't. They're doing the same in Florida. They're doing the same in Georgia. And they only have to flip one or two or three of those states and they're almost certainly going to win 2020. That's their plan. Does any of this seem a bit way out or implausible? And you saw this play out in Alabama. Remember when uh, Roy Moore was running in Alabama recently for the Senate? And he should have easily won that. But he got in trouble with the scandals. So Steve Phillips put a whole bunch of money into Alabama into the black, Latino, and Muslim communities in Alabama. And they started, they reinvigorated the communist networks that have been there since the civil rights era. And they mounted a vote or die campaign amongst the black communities. They told them that if they didn't vote Democrat, the Klan was coming back. Seriously. 
That's what they did. And they won by 20,000 votes. And the head of CARE in Alabama, Council on American Islamic Relations, boasted that Muslims won the election because they had signed up 20,000 Muslims in Alabama to vote, and they all voted for the Democrat. So this is a strategy they are pursuing right now. And I'll tell you, if you're interested, who I believe they're going to run for president in 2020. There's two of them. One of them will be on the ticket, maybe both. You see if I'm right, and I'm owed a steak dinner if I am, okay? <laughs> right? So at Stanford University, Steve Phillips had a, a, a young radical friend. He wasn't a real radical, but he was a radical. And he was a young black football player. And Steve Phillips put a lot of money behind him. And in 2013, he got him elected to the U.S. Senate from New Jersey. That is Cory Booker, Spartacus. And he's just been in Iowa this week getting ready for the run. Now, he also, Steve Phillips also had another friend, a woman called, uh, a young woman. She was half Asian American, half, native, half black. And uh, she became a top operative in the Hillary Clinton campaign. Her husband, a man called Tony West, became the number three in the Justice Department under Eric Holder on the recommendation of Steve Phillips, who recommended many people for the Obama administration. Tony West is married to a woman called Maya Harris. Her sister is Kamala Harris, the senator from California. So they are going to run Kamala Harris, woman, black, Asian, probably on the top of the ticket, they're going to re. Uh, my mammy Cory Booker is on the, dip, in the on the pres vice presidential ticket, and they're going to run the Rainbow Coalition right across the South against what they hope is an extremely damaged and impeached President Trump, and they aim to win with 51, 52, 53 percent of the vote, and then they're going to legalise every single illegal immigrant left in the country. And then they're going to ramp up refugee resettlement from the Middle East. And they're going to turn American conservatives and Christians into a minority in their own country. That is their plan. And if you don't think you'll be a persecuted minority, you've never read a history book, people. Okay? So, does this sound plausible? Because this is what they're trying to do, folks. So the good news is, President Trump has put a dirty big spanner in their works, right? Because they did not expect him to win. They expected Hillary Clinton to win and cover up all their crimes and carry out their program. So when President Trump won, and he's starting to get popular with the black base, and he's starting to get popular with the Latino base, and he's starting to bring a whole bunch of people over, they understand they have to destroy him. They have to. Because otherwise, all of their 50, 60 years of plotting turns to dust. It crumbles away. So this is why I say this is the most important election we've faced. This is the most important. The next two years is the crisis point. Right? Because America's either going to get way worse or way better. So, has anybody ever, you know, and... and I'm not blind to President Trump's faults, as I'm sure you're not either. I was as close to never Trump as you could get people. But has anybody ever seen a president in his first term of office fulfill as many of his promises as this one? You've got to give him credit for that, folks. He has done a lot of good stuff. Moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, the taxes coming down, getting us out of the Clim Paris Climate Accords, getting us out of UNESCO, the UN Human Rights Commission. No other Republicans done that for a long time, folks. Anything close. So I think that's worth a bit of support. So, and all of that has been done with one hand tied behind his back. Because since majority in the Senate has been that thin, two-seat majority, and two of those are Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, who may as well be Democrats, and they give Mitch McConnell a whole bunch of leverage. Makes it very hard for President Trump to get, to get done what he wants to do. 
They have stopped them building the wall. They've stopped them doing a whole bunch of stuff. You know, they want to run this election on taxation when everybody knows that immigration is the big issue. Right? So, so he's done all of that with one hand tied behind his back. You imagine what he could do if he were unleashed. If he had a substantial majority in the Senate and the House, the House run, you know, and, and keep, keep control of the House. See, right now there's about six Senate seats that are seriously in play that the Republicans could win. And I don't just mean rhino Republicans. Virtually all of them are being, com are being competed for by very conservative Republicans. Maybe not as conservative as we would wish, but a heck of a lot better than we have seen in a long time. So you've got a whole bunch of legislation in your country, a whole bunch of government departments that have been kept in place since FDR and, and President Johnson by a liberal majority in the Supreme Court. They have, it's been impossible to get rid of these government departments and these bad programs. They have trashed your First and Second Amendment wherever they possibly could because the Liberals have controlled the Supreme Court for 50 years now. Well, now there's a Conservative majority. And maybe not enough of a Conservative majority, but you imagine what could be done by President Trump if we hold the House and increase the majority in the Senate. I want to see things like, OK, he's already got us out of UNESCO, out of uh, UN Human Rights Commission, we need to amp up what the JBS has been pushing for many years. President, two-term President Trump, we've got to get right out of the UN. Right. Completely out of the UN. Right? Now, can you see that happening? Can you see that as a possibility under second-term President Trump? Sure. It's possible, right? More possible than we've ever had before. Is it something worth trying to do? Yeah. You had the best public education system in, your, in the world for 200 years, folks, until Jimmy Carter, it's only that recent, come along and established the Department of Education and screwed it all up for you. Well, right now, I think we have to mount a major campaign after this midterm elections and into the next term. We've got to push President Trump to totally defund and abolish the Department of Education. Right? Yeah. What greater favour could you give your kids than that, people? Yeah. What greater thing could you do for your children than get rid of that? The, the biggest child molestation factory in the country. <laughs> Roe v. Wade, you know? Roe v. Wade. There's a serious possibility that that could be re-looked re at. Very serious. Better chance than you've had for a long time. There's a whole raft of unconstitutional government programs and government departments that could be taken to a Conservative Supreme Court to rule on their constitutionality. You think that's a possibility too? So all of the things that the John Birch Society has been talking about for a very long term, we have at last a window of opportunity where many of those things could finally be seriously addressed. Now, none of that's guaranteed, but I'll tell you what, if we lose the House, it's off the table. But if we win and keep winning, a lot of these policy things that we are so urgent about, have we have a chance of addressing. And that's for the 5-4 majority on the Supreme Court. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is getting pretty old people. <laughs> And she has publicly said that she wants to retire in New Zealand. <laughs> well, I'm willing to take one for the team, folks. I'll do it. I'll make the sacrifice. You send her down there, we'll look after her. You'll have a 6 3 majority, and wow, will the president be unleashed. <laughs> So what I'm saying here is, the consequences of blowing this great opportunity are pretty dire. But the positive possibilities are out of this world. And it could all depend on one or two seats in Congress, 
There are 23 seats in play. And I understand that a whole bunch of these Republicans are useless. I understand that. I'd say about a third of the Republican caucus is big government progressives. About a third of them, a quarter of them, are patriots and constitutionalists. And the rest couldn't tie their own shoelaces. <laughs> I know that. I know that. But if Jim Jordan was the leader of the House, and we could get someone like Ted Cruz as leader of the Senate, the go-alongs to get-alongs would go along with us. And we would become the dominant faction. Just like happened under Reagan. You know, the Republicans hated Reagan. Reagan, Ronald Reagan was banned from Ohio in 1976 because he was a far right winger who would bring disgrace on the GOP. But when he started getting a few victories, the go-alongs to get-alongs went along with him. Now they hold Lincoln dinners every year and say how wonderful he was and how they always loved him. Okay? So, I'm not blind to the realities of this. I'm not blind to the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm not blind to the, the Bilderberger types that run this, run this world. But sometimes the good guys win one, folks. We just won a big victory in Brazil just this two days ago. We won a big victory in 2016. And we could string together some victories that create a second American Revolution. Now, you know this country never should have been founded, folks. You had a bunch of farmers and blacksmiths and lawyers with squirrel rifles <laughs> taking on the world's greatest military empire. Were they nuts or what, folks? Now, how crazy was that? And they were beaten across every state. They lost almost every battle. It took them eight long years. They were starving and freezing and never getting paid. And they were losing their troops. And we've got to remember, only 3% of your population fought in that war. Only 20% supported it. 40% supported the British. And the rest didn't give a damn. Is this familiar to you guys? <laughs> but despite all of that, they won. And why did they win? I think it's because George Washington got down on his knees and he prayed at Valley Forge, folks. And he got up and he went on to take the British out at Yorktown and turn the course of the war. And not just the course of the war, the course of world history. For the first time in world history, you had a government out of Mosaic law, representative government, where your rights came from God, not the government. They were given directly to the people and the people chose their representatives to preserve those rights. This was a total departure from all of world history. The good guys win sometimes, people. So I'm asking of you folks, if you're not involved in any of the good campaigns, and you'll find some, if you're not involved in campaign, get involved. Get involved in phone banking. Get involved in door knocking. You know, if you haven't written out a check to a good conservative somewhere, write one out. Because that might be the check that pays for the yard signs, that wins that seat by 10 votes, that wins the house. It could be that close. Remember the famous hanging chads of, yeah. you know? <laughs> You know, you would have all died of boredom in the first term of an Al Gore government, people. You know? But it saved the country. You know, you, you, you... Not saying Bush was great, he wasn't, but I know what I would have preferred, okay? So things are close. Things are very, very close. And the check you write, or the door-knocking shift you may do, could make the difference. Now, I just want to say, or take... Here's, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it everything tonight, people. I'm on fire tonight. <laughs> giving you both barrels. Tell me, which state, which state won the most, that had, had the most impact on the 2016 election? Which state won the election for President Trump? You're all wrong. It's California. Because California had 400,000 phone bankers 275,000 phoning on any given evening. Wow. 
And five weeks before the election, they told them to stop phoning into California and phone into Florida, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan. and Michigan, and they won every one of them, people. So do not tell me that you cannot have an impact. Doesn't have to be in your local area. If, you, if you're not happy with your candidate, find one you are. Send them a check. Ted Cruz could do us some checks in, Florida, in, in um, Texas right now, people. No, Beto O'Rourke has got $38 million in, three, in the last three months to fight him. Ted will win, but I want Ted to win by 15 points, not five. Okay? So, this is what I'm saying. Get involved for the next two weeks. It's not a big sacrifice, right? Blow off that holiday in Vegas. Send a check. I'm serious. I'm really serious. Because this is your children's future. You've got a great opportunity for your kids right now. And your investment could pay off big time. Get involved with the JBS, because it doesn't just count in election times. You're going to be involved all the way through, people. Here's a little thing I say sometimes. 200 years from now, 200 years from now, there'll be a young kid in this room, in a high school in your town, and he'll get up and he'll do a history project and he'll say, I did some genealogical research. And you know that time in American history when we had the second American Revolution, just over the Obama, after the Obama years when everything was looking so bad, and they seized back the country and they restored the Constitution? Well, I did some research and I was so proud because I looked back and I found out that my great, 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 great grandma and granddaddy were in the JBS. <laughs> People, when the history of this country is written, the John Birch Society will earn a very, very noble place. I can assure you of that. <laughs> so I'm telling you this, folks. Do nothing. You risk slavery for your kids, if not for yourself. Give it everything you've got within you for the next two or three or four years, because by the time the Democrats have been defeated four times, this country's going to look very different. You're going to be a lot richer and a lot happier. Give it everything you've got for those next few years and beyond. Two things may happen. One is you could give it everything you've got for your God, your constitution, your country and your family. You can give it everything you've got and conceivably we might lose. But at least you will all earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. And what is that worth to you folks? And if you win, and you absolutely can win this folks, because that last election, that proved to me that God is not finished with this country yet, folks. <laughs> if you win and keep on winning, and we have another moment in history like the American Revolution, if you keep on doing that, you will spark an economic boom. But better than that, you will spark a liberty boom, not just in this country, but across the world, people. What has happened in Brazil, Brexit will just be the first rumblings of it. You will spark an economic boom, a liberty boom, and you will give your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. Is that worth fighting for, folks? So I say to all of you here tonight, thank you so much for what you do for America, for my country, and for liberty. God bless America, and God bless the JBS, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. What I do is because people like you are doing what you're doing. So I'm very proud to be amongst you and very grateful to be invited to speak to you. So thank you very much. Thank you.